a, a very long day. Uh, we're about to start a very, a very long lecture, about an hour late, which we're really sorry to everybody who come direct only for the lecture, not for the DRL reviews. Um, so we're putting um, David Erdman and Clover Lee through a treadmill who've just gone through uh, 10 hours of reviewing, and um, we're really thrilled that you could join us for the, for the reviews today. Um, David and Clover uh, form the two principles of David Clover, David Clover um, a practice that uh, is currently based in LA and Houston, but is on its way to relocating in Hong Kong, to Hong Kong soon. Um, Clover's background is uh, having studied at Harvard and Cornell as on the faculty of Rice University and teaches at uh, the University of Michigan. It's the Rome studio abroad. Uh, and David, uh, who studied at OSU, Ohio State University in Columbia, uh, is on the faculty of UCLA um, and has taught visiting studios at Rice, Berkeley, and University of Michigan. Um, David recently <coughs> won the, the Prix de Rome, or is it Rome Prize in English, I guess? Um, and, and both David and Clover are teaching uh, in Rome at, at the moment with U Michigan. I might be getting my facts entirely wrong, I'm not sure. They'll, they'll correct me if I'm not. Um, tonight's lecture, which I presume is on directly on the work of the practice, uh, titled Amass. Um, to do, I'm sure they'll elaborate what this is really in detail, uh, to do with mass production, mass customization, mass media, uh, and their position uh, relative to uh, a mass. Join me please in welcoming David Erdman and Clover Lee. Um, do we usually keep this light on? We need to turn it off. Yeah, I think that'll be fine. Uh, well, thank you, Tom and, and Brett, for having us here this evening. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, around so many esteemed colleagues and friends. Um, we're happy to be the first American architects to lecture here under our 44th president. Hopefully that's not the only reason you'll remember our lecture. Um, Gertrude Stein once said, a rose is a rose is a rose is a rose. And to us, mass is a mass is a mass is a mass. Or the title of our lecture is a way in which we're trying to um, conceptually um, capture some of the ways that Clover and I are starting to work together. Uh, to this extent, when one amasses something, they're collecting or organizing particles into something larger. Um, Clover and I both have very different uh, backgrounds and different interests. And so through our practice, what we're trying to do is bring together things which don't necessarily fit together um, or things which otherwise might be um, have a lack of coherence. To this extent, our name and our interests are a kind of instance of mistaken identity. Mass as a general con concept has been a shared intrigue of ours, um, and it connects the two projects that we're going to primarily be showing you this evening, which showcase, uh, as we've moved out of our previous practices, um, uh, how we're beginning to work together. And there's a particular posture that we associate with this. Many architects, of course, have done work on mass, but, but to us, there's some interesting things about it that are allowing us to begin to take a step back from some of the earlier work we did. Um, it's about weight and presence as opposed to the ephemeral. Um, it's about joining surfaces or working on the corner or a seam as opposed to working within the space of a surface. It has contrast and boundaries. To some extent, it has the ability to be uncanny or alienating, and this is something that intrigues us, its ability to use the familiar to produce unfamiliar sensations. Um, a good example of this is Andrea Piccinini's uh, transgenic sculptures, which use very precise technologies and ideas about skin, uh, about program, whether it's about age or genome, to produce a kind of uh, disorienting effect. It's a little out of focus, it's unclear exactly what your distance is to the object, both literally and in terms of your heritage. Uh, and so this idea about it having an ambiguity of scale is something that interests us. It's uh, at once large and discrete. The terms that Tom mentioned, uh, mass audience, mass appeal, mass production, our familiar friend, mass, customi mass customization, uh, each attempts to 
to some extent relate an individual to a larger audience or a private to a public space. Um, it has something to do with that audience, something to do with part to whole relationships. Uh, and th through the projects that we're currently working on, what we're trying to do is rather than getting the whole to resonate with the part or uh, kind of simply accumulate parts, um, we're trying to work with proximities, uh, weights, luminosities to confuse but not obliterate part to whole relationships, um, explore ways that they might appear larger or smaller than they actually are. Uh, the kind of work that we've been getting has been producing some awarenesses um, that a lot of the work uh, has very little, if any, self-similarities. Programs are contrasting. Um, the needs are very diverse. And quite often, we're being asked to make sense of somewhat otherwise unrelated agendas. Uh, and so not only because of our backgrounds, but, but the way that we collaborate with others and together, we think trying to work with difference uh, as a design aptitude is somewhat advantageous. Um, it pushes, for instance, ideas of cohesion uh, above issues of continuity. We'll be using the terms mass production and mass media uh, tonight um, to describe different yet related ways that we're working with mass in these projects. Um, neither of these will we be using conventionally. Uh, while our projects are digitally and materially driven, uh, and we use a lot of contemporary fabrication technologies, uh, our interest is not really in showcasing or foregrounding those technologies or the issue of standardizing goods or buildings for mass production. It's more a play on terms, and our interests are more devoted to the effect where we're seeking out degrees of massiveness uh, and exploring uh, ways of working with weight or the physical aspects of these projects. Uh, in our previous practices, there have been threads of this that have kind of hinted to how we're now working, uh, and we'll be showing you some of that work throughout the evening. Um, and I think one thing that we have uh, started exploring is a c willingness to work with different types of mass, that actually the more difference that you work with, the more you can enhance um, certain effects. Uh, where you start contrasting things, um, and you get a blurring of that as well as emergence, kind of both happen happening at the same time. I think we're also trying to look at whether or not this means that you have to produce a figure with the perimeter of the project, or you can um, kind of activate masses within it that might have a lighter touch on the perimeter. Uh, or looking at ways that you can kind of bring two different kinds of mass very close together, almost at the the brink of juxtaposition and um, rhythmic continuity, all as a means of looking at how to produce something that's outside of the physical boundary of the mass itself. Mass media is a little bit different, um, and this uh, in terms of another dimension of how we're working with mass. Uh, again, we're using this term in a bit of an exotic way, um, so we're not using it in the traditional way that you would use it in terms of talking about a communication medium like television to deliver a message to a larger audience. Um, in our work, it's an exploration of how forms of energy uh, begin to exchange with mass or try to shift it into differing states. There are numerous global energy initiatives that everyone is having to struggle with right now. Um, and in particular, uh, a lot of cities that are looking to accessorize buildings with lights in a way that Jeff Kipnis apparently is very upset about because this tends to be uplighting them. Um, and we think that all of that, amongst a host of other reasons, are a cause for designers to have an aptitude for working with new media. Um, we try to, in our work, not only accept it as part of the architecture, but collaborate with other artists um, who are using it. Um, in terms of energy, we're trying to work with it in ways that uh, are not only about assuming that it has to become part of the building, but generate a theoretical aptitude about how to design energy itself. So as opposed to projects that purify mass, we're looking for attention where the introduction of media is enmeshed into the mass. It begins to shift its state or kind of shift its dimensionality. For us, this certainly has something to do with dimensionality and certain ideas of directionality, um, where we're giving it certain gravitational pulls, um, we're looking at ways to not spread it around evenly everywhere, but harness it in very particular areas. 
and direct media that in some instances may have one or two dimensions and trying to shift it into 3D, 4D, or 5D. This is kind of like shifting a liquid to a solid, but for us it's looking, trying to think about this in terms of the relationship of media to mass uh, and explore it as having some degree of agency where it begins to become an active participant with it and begin to pry it open or do work on it. So this project was the first opportunity we had to test out more explicit techniques, how we can look at what David described as these shifts in dimensionality or these changes of state. This project is called Light Mass, um, and it was a particularly challenging project for us because the project called for uh, the design of one fixed module that has to be repeated. So for us, it kind of ups the ante in terms of how we're gonna search for these shifting states across multiple scales. And with light mass, we focused on the, the perception and the sensation of these shifting states. So we worked with like how uh, lightness and massiveness would play off one another or how opacity and transparency can move across one another. Um, the project uh, Light Mass is uh, the design of 200 artist live work units in Beijing. Uh, in an area called the Greater Beijing Arts District right here, um, GBD, it's conceived of as a cultural counterpart to this uh, commercial business district of Beijing, which is in the kind of where the CCTV is. The GBD Arts District is a kind of also conceived of as different to 798, which is up here, you see. It's an existing kind of artist community in Beijing. Um, the slide on the left is a, is a view of the inside of 798 in Beijing, and Island 6 is another similar artist community in Shanghai, both of which uh, occupy existing buildings. The developer who initiated GBD, it's a, it's a private developer. He's actually an Italian who owns a, a furniture manufacturing company in Beijing. Um, he envisioned GBD as, he didn't want it to be an existing building. He saw it more as a, a community that supported both contemporary art and contemporary architecture. So he wanted to build the build, commission the design projects, the building projects in the site. Um, so the site for the artist units are here, and the rest of the lot he's, he planned for second phases for kind of performance venues, um, art exhibit venues, etc. So the site was occupied with a bunch of one-story brick buildings that was used for light manufacturing. Um, we actually uh, lost the project, uh, lost the competition, but we were then subsequently asked by the developer to build 28 units out of the 200. Um, they picked 15 schemes to build on the site. So our, our area ended up spilling out of the original site being here, I think 20 units here and about eight units right there. We went to visit the site three, about three months after the competition and they were really quick. They already demoed all the buildings on the site. It was totally empty. And we saw the site kind of as a tabula rasa that um, the unit itself that we design is going to create this kind of highly artificial context. The competition requirements were really strict only with regards to the unit. Um, it had to adhere to a strict footprint of five meters by five meters. It's specified that each unit must have a gallery, a studio, a living space, and a roof garden. It has to be in this order and it has to stack uh, in that way. So the strict footprint and the height limitation basically implied that the unit will have to be very compact and a very kind of singular mass, which also results in very low ceiling heights for both the gallery and the studio. So the first thing we did was figure out how to work with the studio, uh, beef it up and flip it up, and then shove it out to grab the air rights so that we're still, our footprint is still five meters by five meters, but we're creating kind of more robust boundary that's beyond that five meter. And as a result, we also get a higher ceiling height for our gallery. The red is the cir circulation within the unit. So the GBD, the charge of the project was, you know, didn't only anticipate uh, as a means of showcasing the artist's work, but also, you know, fostering exchange and interaction between the artists. So 
the this how we envisioned the the unit itself is this kind of two masses playing off each other. The studio that's been beefed up and shoved out becomes this kind of heavy opaque mass that's suspended within the more transparent plinth that holds the gallery, the living space, and the roof garden. And we pulled a kind of circuits vertically through the units that holds the vertical circulation, like you see the stair here. The, all the yellow are storage spaces. The blue is um, like bathroom and kitchen that's plugged into this area. So in terms of this kind of exchange that they want to, they, that they envision for the GPD, we thought about you know, how, how we can support like two social networks within these units and between the units. So here's an example where the units are conjoined at the studio so that, for example, this gallery and this gallery can claim this outdoor space that's defined by the studio. There's also kind of cross connection between the roof gardens and the more private social circuit, which is um, the interior circulation, is nested between the two masses. So the studio, you're kind of moving in and out of it as you're working your way vertically through the space if you live in it. Um, or even if you're going to the gallery, you're under it or behind it, there's a couple different locations that you begin to interact with it on the roof, uh, the ground, uh, living or in the street. And perceptually, what we were trying to do here was shift its qualities when you're in these different areas. So we are thinking of the studio really as an emitter of certain kinds of effects. So we're trying to get it to play with a larger boundary uh, interact with the plinth in a way that when you're in these different zones, you have different kinds of um, relationships to it. Uh, this, we took this, that idea and some of the things that the client was asking us to do as an opportunity to begin to rethink um, how we could model it, how we might be able to chart out the limits of those effects, um, and as well as uh, use it as an opportunity to begin to think about how we could develop some drawings for the local uh, architect that we're working with there, um, which led us to some rather unexpected and slightly strange places that um, at least we found ourselves in, um, largely because we don't, we don't really foreground um, either production or structure. So looking at somebody like Buckminster Fuller is kind of the last person we should or um, thought we would be looking at. However, we found ourselves um, caught up in these strange uh, energy models of geometry that Fuller did in his work, uh, uh, in his book, Synergetics. And he essentially argues in one part of this book, it's huge, um, for a transformational geometry, um, where stability uh, is really just a temporal event or a, a temporary moment within a larger set of possibilities of geometry. So all geometry in this sense has energy flowing through it. It can stabilize or destabilize. Um, you know, it sounds a little 60s, but uh, it's gonna get a little weirder. Um, this model, which uh, beyond its humor in terms of watching Bucky dance with it, um, became interesting to us really not so much in its kinematics uh, or the literal motion of it, but in terms of how he begins trying to think about how to anticipate or model uh, how all of these equilateral triangles or completely mod modular figures begin to interact with one another. Um, he talks about this as a shifting of states, um, which for him is structural, which is not so interesting for us, but the, the perceptual possibilities of this is where we became intrigued. But he talks about it as two equilibrial states, an A and D, and more disorderly or less equilibrial states where these equilateral triangles are rotating between positions. He calls these, and what really caught our attention here was he calls these pulses and frequencies of geometry. And what we drew from this model um, was first the idea that geometry can shift between two very distinct, radically different states. And uh, that one could, based on orientation or rotation, uh, imbue it with different, different perceptions. The second is how he charts this out. Each of these triangles move around within this box, or what is called a bounding box, uh, which begins to imply the, a larger space around the actual material that you're seeing here. So it's a way to track something which is not seen 
uh, and this for us, we, we, it might be a stretch, but we, we started using this to try to figure out how we could look at uh, how certain uh, arcs and other things might be uh, uh, developing different effects on the plinth. Uh, the, the kind of larger move of this is the roof plane is rotated 45 to the ground plane and they have to participate with a number of different constraints where the studio floor is more planar, the walls are planar for the artist, the roof has to break open to let daylight in and pop up for the roof. The sides kind of take this up a bit. What we're doing here is each of these uh, boundary curves starts to participate in different territories which combined the green, the red, and the blue form this larger cube. But what starts happening is these, when they combine together, the surface that you see is actually moving between a number of different territories uh, where it's dipping down toward the ground here, popping up toward the roof here, uh, all participating within this much larger um, box. And this kind of layers on top of itself through the studio. Similar things happen with the ground floor. And this just kind of shows the composite dynamic um, between all of these bounding boxes. What we were hoping this would do and what we started looking at here is how this produces, for instance, this kind of pressing down toward this corner uh, over here or how this sharper corner begins to weigh down um, over the, press down over the ground plane of the gallery. Um, we're working these two corners quite differently. This one we're working as a transition toward the ground. This one starts to peel open and reveal the studio and push back. So on the outside, a lot of this has to do with it having weight and slightly revealing the artist, kind of pushing the artist out over the street. On the inside, they're in this cocoon-like space, which is seemingly opaque, but we're trying to, in a sense, shift these uh, weights here, where what's opaque becomes much softer, what's transparent becomes much heavier. So the way these curves part uh, to allow the glass to kind of press down on it or push this corner in are ways that we're thinking about the outside space uh, beginning to uh, work its way into the space of the studio. The objective here was really to be able to argue to the client that we're keeping each floor plan totally different, which is really what they wanted, but at the same time set up other continuities or discontinuities, uh, not only within the unit, but start looking at how we could do that between units. So beyond the qualities that we seek out within in the interior, I think it was important to us how the geometrical work that David was describing um, within the studio, what that what will happen, or what, what are the implications at a larger scale when these units start to aggregate together. So for example, um, that corner that was cracking open, to us, privilege is kind of more of an edge-to-edge -edge conjoining than face-to-face uh, -face merging. So it will imply a certain type of way these units will come together. On top of that, apart from just kind of form and geometry, we're also wanting to see, you know, what are the programmatic implications um, of the aggregations, how we can mix the public, the private, the artists, and the viewers to create a kind of larger scale spatial rhythms kind of uh, within the complex. So here's a plan of four units coming together. Um, it's a second floor plan. So these are the studios. Uh, the dashed line you see is the kind of skylight um, above it and uh, looking down at the four gallery spaces. So in this case, we kind of condense and collapse um, the studios in order to create a kind of almost even heavier and more massive um, mass sitting within the plinth, uh, the transparent plinth. And again, the four galleries can basically start to group together. So it creates a kind of juxtaposed cadence between the aggregated studios and the, um, the transparent plinth, which is defined by these kind of party walls that kind of march along between the galleries. We developed three specific uh, types of aggregation, uh, two of which were selected by the developer. They wanted to do uh, aggregate A and aggregate C. I think they're mostly aggregate C, right? Um, the aggregate A we called the Uffizi, very straightforward linear organization. Aggregate B is more pixelated, kind of bottom up. 
we call it the SOHO. It results in a more meandering and labyrinthian way of moving through the site. And the third type is aggregate C, which is similar to the plan that you just saw. So you can see when there are more units, basically how you know the, the four galleries of these four units share the space below, but then the rooftop is shared by these four units that are now kind of back to back. So at the larger site scale, I mean, we wanted to look at you know, how we can fit different clusters within the 200 units. This was before we knew that we're only doing 28. And in a sense, I think what is critical is whether or not the different aggregations, whether or not the, the, the mass of the unit itself becomes identifiable or are there larger scale effects when they come together in different ways. In some of the previous projects where we worked with multiples, um, we noticed that the behavior of the aggregation very much depends on the kind of quality um, of the unit itself, of the module. So let's say one strategy is to have two types of masses with uh, different behaviors, or you can have one type of mass with different uh, behaviors embedded in it. So for example, in, in one case, it's like solid and void. And to us, it's more interesting if we can think about it not so much in opposition, but void is just another species of solid or another kind of mass, having similar qualities such as density and weight. So uh, one example where we looked at this is this project for six units of townhouse in the Garden District of New Orleans. This project was commissioned by a developer in New Orleans. Uh, it happened soon after Katrina. And the developer wanted to really pack out the site in an area that's renowned for its open spaces. So in response to this kind of overstuffed condition, what we did was we developed a series of highly textural masses that is like filigree. And it's not dissimilar to the kind of wrought iron ornamentation that you see very often in front porches and houses in New Orleans, except our filigree is kind of like on steroids and pressed into the pressed into the mass. So these filigree pockets kind of zippers through the dense mass in order to blur the boundaries between the units. And what we're interested in is kind of visual high contrast between the filigree mass and the dense mass. And we try to take advantage of the tension between the two to set up a rhythm within the site. Here you can see that um, the filigree mass basically holds the vertical circulation through the units. So you're moving along it as well as a means of moving across uh, between the two types of masses. The filigree mass also takes on uh, lighting and kind of structural responsibilities. Because of its open frame, it allows us to push light kind of deep into the site, deep into the unit. And also it takes on the kind of lateral bracing of the dense mass. And both masses are kind of squeezed into one another, uh, but not, not, not necessarily we see it in opposition. So in a similar way in light mass, I don't think we see the studio and the plinth as being in opposition. Um, the relationship is actually much more fluid. So the differences and similarities uh, kind of congeal and dissipate based on use and based on organization. So in this case, which is going back to the aggregate C, because they were building more of, we kind of spent more time developing it um, after we found out they were going to build it. The, the four cracked corners of the units kind of gels together and gains a kind of critical mass so that it becomes its own luminescent mass that's pushed through the opaque kind of solid studio mass. And both of which is playing off the transparency of the plinth and defining these kind of outdoor um, outdoor garden spaces for the galleries. We see um, these kind of urban transformations that are partnered up with uh, formal and perceptual effects are, that's where we, we think that it's, we see it as the shifting states um, that David was describing earlier on, both in use and in appearance. So in a way it's not kind of on off, uh, kind of opaque and transparent but it's much more uneven in, in terms of distribution of light and activity, um, creating more dynamic and gradient states. So going back to, I think, um, Bucky's jitterbug, um, we learned a lot from looking at it because of how uh, it basically can condense and compact multiple, multiple geometries and basically find the, 
the, the, the states in between them. And it helps us a lot in terms of when we're looking at the project, calibrating the relationship between weight and pressure of the mass. But it's also because of our interest in weight um, that I think defies a literal translation of Bucky's transformational geometries. Again, we're not, we're not so much interested in the literal or physical transformations, but more of um, a perceptual and sensation of the kind of perception and sensation of these transformational geometries. So while the jitterbug, I would say, is a kind of no contrast construct, it seamlessly shifts between the states, we're interested in more of a high, con high contrast environment, which is in this case, uh, it's the project is called Lunar House. Um, we, we want to work with these kind of opposing ends of the spectrum from incredibly heavy with the incredibly light, and we try to work with media to explore this kind of spectrum that's in between. Um, we're designing this house in collaboration with artist C.E.B. Reese. Um, part of it is driven by the developer. Um, there are a number of other designers working with them. And in our house, we're trying to talk about the relationship of contemporary art to domestic space. Um, it's a, we see this as an exploration into a new sort of fresco, but it's flipped to the outside. Um, Right now, Clover and I are based in Rome, so of course we're seeing uh, aspects of this project with new eyes as we're beginning to develop it, um, which is allowing us, uh, for better or worse, to draw upon historical relationships between painting, sculpture, uh, and, and architecture. Uh, more specifically, we've been looking at the concept of Il Disegno, where paintings turn into sculpture, uh, which turns into architecture, uh, and you know, this is a quite a long history. Bernini and Romano um, were kind of pioneers of this early on. I'm sure you know the projects um, that, in, that capture this, or if you don't, um, Palazzo del Te, uh, San Andrea al Quirinale. Um, we're trying to rethink some of this instead of in a masterly model, the way that it was done historically, in a collaborative model, using uh, contemporary media software design and looking at new forms of artistic practice. Before explaining uh, more about the house, though, we wanted to take a little detour to elaborate on our idea of mass media um, using some previous work uh, that we did in our previous practices that kind of hints toward our current perspective on this. Uh, in retail, at least the stuff that we have worked on, the boundary between media or the more traditional notion of it uh, in architecture seems somewhat blurred. Um, when I was um, working with Servo and Nike asked us to um, design this space, they asked us to work with graphic designer um, Connie Pirtle. Uh, the project that they asked us to do work on is uh, speed and its genealogical relationship to 30 of their most acclaimed sneakers. Uh, and our approach was to figure out how to feel speed in the space, um, or we were trying to figure out a way to speed up the architecture and slow down the people, uh, a lot of which was um, thought through in terms of how we developed this luminous ceiling. It has to do with uh, how the suspended sneakers begin to interplay off the columns, um, become obstacles in the space, or form larger archipelagos of information that work their way through the space. Uh, the organization of the sneakers um, and the content of them is physically inscribed uh, into the space. And a lot of what we were doing in our collaboration was looking for ways that the graphics, the texture, um, or the lighting could begin to take on uh, other dimensions. Things as simple as lighting, um, typically used to evenly light the space, are funneled and accelerated uh, down toward the shoes. Uh, this is something that we discussed in meeting as, apl as applying a gravity to the illumination, um, or we spoke about it as getting it to pool. Uh, all of that acceleration is happening at the moment that these act as obstacles in the space and you have to slow down and move around them uh, where the content is. So that, to some extent, is how we're getting those two speeds to work off of one another. Uh, that type of work, it seems to us, there's never enough room to really show all the information in full that a client may want you to. Um, the graphic designer is quite often, at least in the projects we've had, dealing with a vast amount of 
material that the client wants you to work with and trying to figure out ways to kind of edit, splice, or work that material together. Um, this project uh, that was done for a film score composer in Santa Monica was really no exception to this. It's a very small space. He's done a whole lot of movies, um, and he had a kind of almost adolescent desire to show all of those posters on every square inch of wall space, which of course we didn't have. Um, so our approach was to try to figure out a way to introduce a rhythm and different ideas about depth into the space. Uh, so working with the designer, we enlarged these fragments of posters, um, started thinking about how they could color shift in relationship to uh, colors that were being introduced in the space. You can see how they kind of shift here in these layouts. Um, these were introduced at the areas where you're moving the quickest. So you can see here, these are along hallways. And really the idea is you're never far enough away from them to understand them or have the information be legible, but they act more as a rhythm as you're moving through the space. We were also looking for ways that they could wrap these otherwise very thick poche spaces, these sound studios, um, and begin to diffuse them a little bit by introducing light uh, at these moments through skylights and artificial light. The basic idea was that where it's the thickest, we could use these to diffuse it. Um, where it's the thinnest, how we cosmetically applied color, it might actually make it appear thicker. Uh, there have been other projects where this has been more complex, um, uh, where clients, in this case a curator uh, uh, and museum director, asked us to design an exhibition of 76 artists' work. Um, they asked us to figure out a way to do this with absolutely no walls and in some manner um, purse out of the space uh, at least two different ways to interact with the artwork, one that is much more intimate and one that's much more distracted um, or what we spoke about as being more haptic. Um, our approach was to essentially think of the artwork as photons, as crude as that may sound, and try to figure out a way to harness the energy of it, um, emit it, condense it, capture it at different levels, sectional levels in relationship to your head height. Um, collaborating with the interaction designers on this project was really critical um, because we effectively had to figure out a way to convince the clients that this was not a leap, that because they were already reformatting the artwork into projections, that we could take the work of artists of the caliber of Matthew Barney, Raymond Pettibone, Kathy Opie, and um, convince them that it was an easy and unique opportunity to begin to double it, filter it, uh, or play around with the work without destroying or defacing it. Uh, architecturally, we tried to uh, work together to find a solution for this no room idea, which was um, organized through these strands where you get um, bigger projections happening over your head, smaller ones at head height, and then touch screens, which kind of cluster and are at waist level. Uh, the rear projectors are really the most dense. Um, this is where the artwork condenses and it is capture, captures the two-dimensional cinematic plane. A lot of these were movies and we kind of butterfly it open uh, and are here trying to figure out a way to shift its, its dimensionality. It's really a fusion, I think, of two things which culturally may not want to go together, architecture and art um, or matter and photons. Um, and the photon-heavy approach really benefited us here. Um, other areas collect all of the touch screens. Hopefully you can see this is a rather dark video, but there are people here um, interacting with these. Um, this area was seen more as a zone of emission where pulses are kind of sent over your head uh, into these strands uh, as you're interacting with the artwork. Um, this is both an area of intensification. You have these different rhythms, different movies going on around you as well as isolation. It's the only area where you're looking down. All of the content for the artist's work was in these, uh, in these touch screens. It's interesting to us how these types of collaborations really develop um, languages, details, and tectonics that we may not have otherwise conjured up on our own. Um, for instance, thinking about how we're getting the fiber optics and the lighting effects to interface with the ceiling and housing it produce these kind of strange uh, orifices. And a lot of the production of prototypes, which we generally do at many different scales, is really critical to the project for us to evaluate whether this is subtle enough, or in this case, 
subtle or intense enough. Th these are not things that you're looking at. This camera angle is very low. So this is happening over your head. And it relies much more on the ambient effect of how this washes over you as you're looking down, um, working on these computer screens, which is quite different than out at the ends, um, which we were trying to figure out. This was here in our studio in Santa Monica, how much we could get this to condense out toward the ends uh, here is an, and how much we could get the, the media or the artwork to kind of be a, a monster uh, monster in a, in a box. The exciting and interesting part of these projects are not only their collaborative aspects, but how we're trying to get the media to interface with the architectural design. Um, and a lot of what we're looking at here is how these effects really go beyond the architecture uh, or the media in their own or begin to participate with a larger space. So the projects that David just showed you, they're all um, interior projects, and some of them are temporary projects. So when it came to materiality or weather enclosure, that really wasn't a concern. It didn't pose a problem in those projects. But Lunar House was a different issue. It was a ground-up project. And we really wanted to explore how the media doesn't have to be relegated to the inside of the project and how it could participate in the exterior. So we, um, the Lunar House really is a culmination of three projects coming together. Uh, first is a feasibility study for a photographer for a live workspace. Uh, the second is the uh, research project we've been doing with the artist C.B. Reese that uh, David mentioned. And the third is a prototype house for a developer in Houston. So the first part, the feasibility study for the photographer, was for a space for him and his family up in Malibu, um, in Malibu Canyon, so it's not on the water, uh, on Mulholland Drive. And there were three specific things that we took from a feasibility study that really affected the development of Lunar House. And the first was the program. Um, the photographer wanted to divide it equally, live and work. Um, it was 4,000 square feet, half for living and half for a studio space. And the second thing um, that came from the feasibility study for the photographer is that they wanted a very small footprint. And it's unusual for a site like this in LA where, first of all, it's really big and it's also really flat. But they wanted uh, a, as small a footprint as possible because they want to maximize uh, landscape areas because of the type of photography that he does. Um, the, th the third thing that kind of came out of the photographer's studio that was interesting to us is that uh, it, the site is in a very low density neighborhood. It's up in the canyon. So there are no street lights. There are very, very few neighbors. So at night, it's really kind of pitch black. So we're interested in how we could work with a kind of glowing mass um, so when we were working on variations of massing, we were thinking about, you know, how we wanted the mass to glow from within instead of the much dreaded, as Jeff described today, holding up a, a torch underneath your face, um, and how the mass could maybe kind of disappear into the darkness or kind of emerge from the darkness. So for the feasibility study, we, we focused a lot on how the two types of of live work program comes together into these kind of different massing studies that we're taking um, both daylight and this kind of nightlight situation into consideration. Different versions where they intertwine, they're interdependent or independent, and we're trying to see how they could be read um, as both one and two masses at the same time. So we looked at kind of four massing options for them, pros and cons of just the massing, siting, uh, cost estimation. This was around um, spring of 2008 when uh, the economy started to tank and the project got put on hold. But luckily for us, we got a call from a developer from Houston, I think a couple of months after that, um, it was around the summer, that um, he started a company called Hometa. And what he wanted Hometa to do is to straddle the market between highly customized homes and tracked homes. Um, so he, he solicited kind of, uh, he's working with 20 or so architects in the United States to each develop a prototype house. The only requirement is that each house should not be bigger than 2,500 square feet. And 
um, each firm or architect will provide kind of a base design or base set of drawings that the clients can decide how little or much or none customization that they want to do. So Hometa gave us a, a chance to rethink and expand the scope of Luna House and, and rethink the kind of inputs we're working with. The first thing is that we don't no longer have that big site and we decided to work with a kind of standard uh, American lot of 50 feet by 100 feet which is about 15 meters by 30 meters. Second, we decided to work with a very specific exterior enclosure material, which is Corian solid surface. And the third is to include media. And in this case, uh, we decided to work with light and kind of textural media. Design-wise, the developer gave us carte blanche. We can do whatever we want. And since we no longer had a singular client, um, we decided to develop seven schemes simultaneously, working with similar constraints. So they all have, they're all 2,500 square feet. They all have three bedrooms. And we inject, we added the kind of work component to it, similar to the photographer's studio. Um, and they all are working with a similar material and construction system. And all of them have also one, we try to um, use only one way on one way to control the transformation of geometry. So the seven schemes were developed in parallel and not in sequence because we think a prototype doesn't necessarily mean a singular massing geometry. Um, for us, it means that we work with the same parameters and same way of controlling them, but that it could have different types of massing geometries as a result. So we explore different kind of uh, representational methods that's not used for presentation and not used as a way of synthesizing information, but for us to really think about what is the kind of makeup of the mass and how the live work program would kind of exert pressure on it. So the representation tool sp starts to imply explicit ways how the mass would react, how it would bifurcate, how it will extract openings within the mass itself. So in this case, you can see this is an example of one of the schemes. Um, the purple is the living space and the gray is the workspace. They're stacked on top of each other, but sharing in plan. And I mean, the living space is much more compartmentalized. The studio space is kind of open plan. And where the two kind of pools starts to conjoin and collapse into one starts to define a kind of more indeterminate space straddling between the two. You can see here where distinctly the two are separated out and here where it collapses together. And it's really towards the center where the controlling geometry becomes much more um, kind of relaxed, um, responding to the pressures of the live work program pushing up against it. And this is where the geometry starts to torque and the edges kind of bifurcate and splays open. We used um, these diagrams really as a kind of design tool to track what's happening across the seven schemes and where our points of control are. So this is a, a series of sections cutting through, again, this version. So this where they splay open, this is here where they collapse and it's cantilevered off the ground, and the center here where um, the form is the most dis distorted, the geometry is kind of most deviated, and the surface is most intense. So the two, we, we worked with two basically exterior enclosure systems. One is the, the Corian solid surface, which is opaque. And it's represented here in the kind of white gray. And the blue line defines the kind of storefront open system. And the two basically cup each other, um, mirrored along the center line. So the downstairs, the, the open space is open in one direction, and the upstairs living space is basically facing the other and the Corian kind of closes in and collapses where the mass cantilevers out. So after developing these series of diagrams to kind of work with the design parameters that we're working with, we plow through a series of plans just to understand how the building can fit into the site and what are the variations we can allow for this kind of prototype but still maintain the relationships that we're interested in. So. We tested its relationship to the geometry of the site. We're interested in kind of placing the building at an angle within the site. We looked at different like core locations, how it will change orientation of the spaces. We try to max out like how many bedrooms and bathrooms we can fit into it.
So this is a sectional view. Um, again, you can see the liv living space is kind of more of a Victorian plan. It's more compartmentalized. The, uh, the workspace below is kind of the more uh, modernist open plan. And this space, which is a kind of indeterminate space, both in kind of program and organization that straddles between the two. It's probably this is the best view where you can see that um, like where the surface, where we talked about as being the most intense, uh, both in texture, lighting, and geometry, doesn't necessarily coincide exactly in terms of its location with where this happens. So I think we're, we actually not so interested in having the two indexing one another, um, but that they're kind of mismatched relationships with one another. So this becomes a kind of matrix that we work with for the seven schemes of the lunar house to, to map out these relationships with massing, geometry, texture, and light. And apart from the drawings, we also worked with a physical model to better understand the relationship between media and the material with Corian that we're interested in working with. The solid surface has a, a material ambiguity um, that on one hand accentuates the mass um, as much as it is a little bit unfamiliar. It doesn't simulate stone or wood uh, or steel. Um, when we exhibited this recently in New York, it was interesting. People seemed to have to uh, touch it to try to figure out how to identify exactly what it was. Uh, we're playing with it, its translucency, um, pushing it by night into a more of a pointillist system where the lights come to the foreground and the mass um, recedes. Part of this is some ideas we're working on with Casey where instead of looking, thinking of a fresco as something that you are looking out from the inside toward a landscape, we're trying to think about the reverse of that, of how you're looking into the site from the neighborhood and how it can act as a kind of suburban um, dark mass. Um, Reese's work is entirely digital. Um, he, he writes software as art. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with his work, he's the co-author of Processing, um, which is a visually based programming language. I, I know almost every project we saw today used scripting, so I'm sure many of you are familiar um, with some of his work, at least in that capacity. His drawings are, are very interesting. Um, he uses algorithmic machines to essentially uh, generate these somewhat maniacal yet incredibly simple drawings, which he always does in series. And this is part of what generated the seven masses series that we worked on. Um, a lot of our work together is focused on how to take these drawings, uh, here an example of an early one for this project, and develop it materially or think about how to shift its dimensionality. Um, because of a variety of issues, Part, partly being our own, we wanted to set up a limited set of objectives in terms of how we would work together. Um, the first of which, quite simply, has to do with how these algorithms could begin to affect the mass and vice versa. Uh, and how we started doing this is coordinating them with unfolded elevations, which essentially ties relationships between seams and corners with growth rates, growth types, uh, and, and densities of lines. This is a little bit choppy right now, but you can see here, this is the second iteration of software design where what we're doing is playing with curvature. We can track what's uh, identical, what's not. We can play with the density. Um, and in a second here, you'll see there are these four different types. These knobs were developed in the second iteration of the software design that Casey worked on. And they allow us to look at, like if it's moving along a seam, how it can spread out from there or in some of the schemes we have kind of corners, and you'll see this one works with that. So it's a way to begin to customize the software and allows us to continue to interact with it. But this is by no means a fluid process between the unfolded elevation, the software, and the model. It requires a lot of intervention, and we find this quite um, interesting. There's a l many steps of editing, redrawing, introdu introduction of hierarchies, tracking this kind of information against other kinds of information. Uh, really the simplest way that we can describe the fresco, for lack of a better term for it, um, is it's a system of relief, score lines, and subtractions that work with the overall mass. 
it's the densest and deepest in these areas um, and almost begins to act against the mass. It starts to crack it open for punched hole openings. Uh, these are the highest points of intensity and these are the areas we're starting to explore how it can shift materials or do other kinds of work, uh, integrate windows, gutters, and seams. We're kind of constantly unrolling and re-rolling this and part of why we developed a model was to try to figure out how the introduction of other materials, secondary and tertiary systems, would start to enhance or diminish uh, a variety of different effects. So as we do this, these kinds of st statistics are changing, which has to do with different kinds of repetition, uh, repetitiousness, different issues of that. Um, we're refining the software to introduce windows, become a bit more specific about things. Um, introducing the grain, for instance, Corian has no grain in it at all. It's a kind of free territory to play with that. Um, started as an etching experiment um, for us where we, you know, we d we're working with DuPont actually directly on this project and it's interesting to note that um, DuPont Great Britain is, is very innovative in, in this uh, area. Corian's only been used on the exterior in a handful of projects. And so, we're still trying to figure that out, so we started by, well, what happens if we do this and everything's flat and we're etching flat lines into it, all of the panels are flat. Um, and this resulted in some, I think, very important failures. We started learning that our connection systems weren't really working very well. Um, and we started realizing that there might be some other opportunities or bigger steps where we could try to figure out ways to get the processing to do more work. Um, and this really starts by thinking about how we can push it more three-dimensionally um, within the space of the material. And here are some tests just kind of looking at that in terms of transitions, uh, as well as combining that with a forming uh, strategy. So instead of trying to get it to do all the work at every scale, we're parsing this out and getting it to do much more local work, but that resonates with uh, larger scale work. So what's happening here is it is digging in more deeply or less deeply, and that's how we're generating this pattern, basically through distances and proximities uh, with a nearly identical set of lines. Um, it also allows us to control, gives us control points to begin to introduce uh, other materials, secondary and tertiary systems, where we have to form these green areas to cut openings for windows and then those are sliced off. And here you can see some of the differences between these two approaches, which I think in the end, a lot of the effort that goes into doing a model this extensively, which is mixing a lot of different media, laser cutting, milling, um, uh, 3D printing, we're looking at partially full-scale parts and some uh, model-scale parts, is to figure out what the impact of all of that is on the space and begin to evaluate that so that we can cycle that back into uh, schematic design. So we learned a lot from working on the model with the actual material, with actual lighting and structure, trying to get the cantilever to work. And the most important of all, I think, is to understand the relationship between the media, understand how it affects uh, the perception of the mass across different scales. So at the site scale, um, we focus on really how you perceive the entire mass. So this is the view from the street um, on approach, and it was important for us to locate it at an angle to the street so that you will see the maximum number of surfaces, corners, and edges and where I think um, the kind of weight and the levitation of the mass, the perception of it is, is the most acute and we try to dial up this high contrast. At the building scale, the singular volume, we focus on the kind of reading of the edges, oscillating to kind of get the sense of the, the lip work program pushing up against the bounding box and challenge the singularity of the volume. And the tectonic scale, you know, working out how media is kind of pressed and infused into the material itself. So we try to basically work, you know, through the model and through the drawings to engage these across these different scales in, in terms of understanding how the media works with mass. 
so in this point, you know, this is where we try to make the, the surface or the material read as kind of thick, soft, and dense, where there's a lot of where the texture and the lighting happens. And even at where the texture and lighting is the most thin and ethereal, or where we try to get the surface to read the most thin and ethereal, the texture is still operating on kind of openings and the wall and the structure. So here on the few on the inside, uh, you can see that some of them puncture through, like the windows and the skylight puncture through. We saw the interior as being kind of as a, um, being in high contrast to the exterior. So we decided to filter out um, the texture um, and only have the openings puncture through and focus on you know, how they operate on this very smooth and matte surface and how the, the pressure of the volume is registered in a very different way, which is through the seams of the surfaces coming together. So you have the continuous but distorted curve. You have this kind of neutral edge and the kind of deflected edge all happening here at the same time. So in the sense, this a lot of things we actually learned from the model that we never anticipated when we're working on the model digitally or through the drawings. So one example is um, this rippling that you see. That wasn't really intended. It came through because of the way we built the molds for shaping the Corian. It was built out of a series of ribs, and the ribs kind of regis registered through onto the surface. And I mean, it just so happens that it kind of occurred where we wanted the surface to be most intense and it adds another layer of texture to the to the to the mass itself. And in a sense, I mean these kind of unanticipated situations, we start to see that the project is in a state of continuous render, whether it's in the model stage or a digital model stage or through drawing stage. And it's really these rendition of sensations that um, drives the kind of technologies, techniques, and experiences that we're working with. Many of the sensations or the desire for them came from uh, renderings, but the challenge for us is really how we construct them and how we fabricate them. And through this process, we really try to focus on this territory that we're interested in, which is between kind of no contrast and high contrast. In a sense, the, the slide that David showed in the very beginning where um, kind of listed she likes, he likes, our hope is that it doesn't necessarily create a neutralized condition, but in, instead it's an amplified one. So we hope that it can be both big and sexy, smart and funny, puzzling and mysterious, composed and provocative, massive and superficial, maybe it will make you ask why, and hopefully it'll make you go wow. Thanks for having us here, and thank you very much for coming. It depends on if you guys are wiped out. No, we found out it is not now. Yeah, right. we can so just go with the hard not, right. no. okay. not at that. Yeah, not at that okay. scale. Um, by the way, it was really a fantastic lecture. I really just want to say in the beginning, and I also thought it was really informative and um, and amplified the relationship and the partnership with Dr. O'Mara and Steve Clark. Sort of thing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we confirmed that. <laughs> being pushed up. Well, it's obviously closed on the glass. Yeah. You know, you don't, you, you hide the structure. It's 
when, when the nature of Coriam essentially being undefined, you don't know the scope. Mm -hmm. Whereas like steel, even though when you're looking at steel over here, it's like it's just you know, it's like a big when you look at it, it's actually much lighter than you think and it's much thinner than you think. Uh -huh. They're actually using aluminum in the steel, it's even heavier than the brick. It's where there's the brick under a lot of false impressions. Mm -hmm. And and the structure is is not is not true. It's what they visually hear is the creation of terribly and a new kind of mastery. Mm -hmm. And a new kind of control over the mind. I understand the body metric to be there and I, I really think it's beautiful, but uh, you know, I'm I'm having a hard time uh, actually I, I, I think it's your fault mostly. <laughs> that you're interested in translucency and I think some of these things I think you should give up really. I would tell uh -huh. you the other day I think <laughs> yeah, I think Clover's right about that, I think Clover's right about that. <laughs> Really, <laughs> okay, I should <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, both projects have a kind of a, a, a kind of memory of modernism interested in human gravity being mm -hmm. being weightlessness. And I think I just I wonder because you mentioned weight. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I think I I um, you know I'm not sure we've gotten there yet. But I think in the in the Beijing project. Um, it's not so much trying to free it. It's to definitely make it more strange and almost uncomfortable. So I don't know if that's really the modernist aspect of it. It seems to me is meant to liberate the mass from the ground and take mm -hmm. it out of the zone of gravity. We are, and I'm not sure we're that successful with it over the studio here, um, where it's cantilevered out over the front yard where it's only five feet above it is right. maybe where we're getting a little bit closer to it. And I think the I think the point you bring up about the materials is, you know, point well taken. It doesn't need to but be something the translucent. Thing I got to is they avoided all can cantilevers have become a cliche of yeah. defeating mass. Mm -hmm. You know, it's also kind of a heroic yes. you know, this this criticism of work I really respect. I, I think I really think the goal to find a new massiveness is not heroic in any way. It's more like it's clearly great. Uh, your interest in materials and technology is affiliated with those who work in public art. I mean, I'm not sure, so sure how you coordinate all these efforts. Yeah. You know, they, don't, they seem at this point at least not well reconciled or even possibly mutually exclusive. Yeah. But certain folks like the cantilever and floating on glass and all the other issues, it's not, it's, it's not that it's not a beautiful building. It's hard to be resist to it. I'm not sure you can <coughs> work to it either. They're too far apart. Yeah. Yeah, it's or too close together. I have a similar question about uh, how you, you described it last year that uh, you're interested in working with photons and you're, you're interested in working in mass or matter in relationship between the two. And this, this well, sort of is our matter. For us. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say light. I still don't understand how you're interested in heaviness because I think the more light light in that you put in mass, the more it will blow, explode, fly away, seem like it's not heavy. And I, I think there's some there's sort of maybe it's a challenge that we don't want to achieve um, for a new kind of heaviness. I mean that's that's fine, but I think that there's a kind of ephemerality in it, um, almost inevitably by by lighting up something that seems solid. Just the light. 
it made a huge difference when we started working with the ground, starting to work with the ground, the house, kind of bringing it up towards the cantilever yeah. versus in the Beijing project, it was really kind of inert. Right. We weren't really working with the ground plane. But it's, a, it's actually supposed to be like landscape stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't yeah. remember that stuff in Europe. Yeah, it's not my map, it's actually a friend of mine, so I'm familiar with this map yeah. Yeah. Okay. that uh, he was talking about. It's also Gay decorator That's does a window. You're giving out my nightlight. <laughs> no, it's definitely. I mean, we're working on the construction documents right now, and doing kind of cost estimation. So probably we don't, we don't know if the lighting can stay. You know, what does that mean? If it can't be, hopefully it won't resort to a kind of up exterior up lighting yeah. situation. you see the New Year's um, celebrations in like Taipei or Hong Kong? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's like anyway, we, fireworks going crazy. We can crazy. talk later. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, any other questions? Okay. I'm hungry. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.